Now the truth is though, <clears throat> I'm gonna challenge us all today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a part of this with you guys, this conversation to really think about what you can potentially accomplish if you set unreasonable goals. If you set goals that deep down make you uncomfortable. Deep down, maybe you don't feel like they'll ever come true. But what happens if you do set those goals? And then what happens if you tell those around you, those you care about these goals? And you tell the public, you tell your suppliers, your employees, your friends, your families, your coworkers, these goals. You create leverage beyond your own self. So my question for you all, before we jump into this, is do you trust yourself? Now seriously, think about that for a second. Do you trust yourself? When I was 17 years old, I did not trust myself. And probably most of us at that age didn't either. But I didn't trust myself so much, I dropped out of high school. I dropped out of high school because I really did not trust myself with my, the future of my life. I, I was living from Saturday through Saturday, looking for the next weekend. I was not thinking beyond seven days. Luckily, through the grace of God or whatever, I made it through that time period of my life. And at 22 years old, one of my great, great close friends passed away from a drug overdose. Too much Oxycontin. And I know that drug and other drugs like it, the opiates have touched and hurt a lot of the families in this room, I'm sure. It affected me, it affected my friends, it affected my community. And I realized that life was really short and can be taken like that. And I started to think about maybe more than a week out. It took me a couple years to get my shit together, but by 25, I was finally ready to act like an adult, to be professional. And it was good timing too because our family business, my parents' company, a landscape company founded in 1986, after 30 years of marriage, my parents decided they're gonna get a divorce. Like many small businesses, my mom ran the books, my dad ran the ops, my brother, myself, my sister, my cousin, a few other family members, and some really loyal employees made up the company. We were doing about a million, million five. My mom decided to move out of state and take her life in a different direction. My dad was in a bad place, obviously. You can imagine after 30 years what's going through his head, so he wasn't really in the day-to-day -day grind of working. But luckily, at that same point, for whatever reason, again, grace of God, call it what you will, I was in a position to trust myself. For the first time in 25 years of my life, I was ready to trust myself. I sat my parents down and said, let me be CEO. I want to take over the ownership. I want to take over the leadership responsibilities. I want to buy my mom out and give my mom the ability to take her life to the next step without having an anchor left here. We were in California. She wanted to move to Oregon. And so we did that. And somehow I convinced my parents at 25 years old, a high school dropout, to give me the CEO title. Titles are free, titles are cheap, titles don't mean shit at the end of the day. It's what you do with that title that really defines you. So, there I am, 25 years old, I got a million dollar company, I've got no idea really what I'm doing. And a business coach calls me out of nowhere, Jonathan Goldhill. Cold calls. Uh, hello? He's like, hey, I'm a family business coach, my name's Jonathan Goldhill, I help businesses scale. I'm like, man, you sound like the guy I need right now. So uh, I hired him. I didn't interview any other coaches. Probably wasn't the best decision, but turns out it was a fantastic decision because Jonathan helped me see a bigger picture. He helped me take control of my future. And that's what I ask all of you today, to think a little bit about, do you trust yourself? What is the future for you? What is the future for your family? Whether you're a company owner, you're an employee, no matter where you are at in your career, this can be taken and applied to personal goals. This can be taken and applied to professional or financial goals. You can hopefully inspire someone in your life that may be in a bad spot. If you're in this room, chances are you're doing pretty damn good because it ain't cheap to get in here. <laughs> so, 2015, there I am, business coach, 
fumbling my way through, and he asked me, what's the company going to be in 15 years? I was like, dude, I don't even know what it's going to be next month. <laughs> like, I'm just trying to make sure we don't go out of business. Our line of credit was tapped out, 100 grand tapped out. Credit cards were tapped out. You know, we hadn't really filed taxes appropriately for a few years. We had some IRS tax bills piling up. It was a bad spot. But he didn't let me off the hook that easily. He really pushed me and said, no, 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 no. No, I need you to create a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG. All right, a BHAG. Let's see, I wanna be a $5 million company by 2025. And he's like, no, no, no. You can do five million in five years. We're not talking about a small goal that's highly achievable. We're talking about something that's gonna scare the shit out of you. Something that's gonna make your parents think you went a little crazy. Like, okay, 30 million, let's go 30 million, right? And at this point, 15 employees, million, million five, right? 30 million seems like, like let's go to the moon type of a goal. <laughs> Never thought I would run a $30 million company. But he believed in me. That's all it took. One person to believe in me. I started trusting myself a little bit more, and I established that goal as our BHAG. 30 million by 2030 and 300 employees because we wanted to impact part of that BHAG. So here we are shooting for the moon. And he's like, where are you gonna be in 2020? Mm, five million. So I was just throwing numbers out. And then I'll fast forward and bring you guys into today. Here we are today. We're a $15 million professional landscape company. We may even do 17 million this year if the fourth quarter goes our way. Next year, we're hoping to be 20. By 2026, 2027, I can say in confidence we're gonna be a $30 million company. Four to three years, three to four years before the goal that we set. And as the years piled up, as every year we grew, and in 2020 we hit 10 million, everyone started looking at each other like, holy shit, we just might do this. Maybe Justin wasn't so insane that, after all. What was the difference? What was the difference after 30 years, my parents had always had this $1 million company? What changed from 2015 to 2023 from 1986 to 2015 that, that never happened, that couldn't happen. I believe it came down to trusting in ourselves, trusting in myself, my team trusting in them. And then another thing we did, which is really, really exciting, is we started to interview our employees and ask them what are their goals. And when an employee came to me and said, I wanna own my own house, I was like, okay, when do you wanna own it? Like, just some point in my life, I wanna own my own house, home. No, 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 I'm gonna push you you need to set a goal, you need to set a date, we're gonna do this together. We started tying their personal goals, sending their kid to college, buying a home, paying off their car, whatever it was, we tied that to the company goals. Said, okay, if you're an account manager, right now you're a foreman, if you can make your way to an account manager, how much money are you gonna make? What does that mean? How are you gonna do this? And we lay out their five-year goal, their five-year plan, maybe their BHAG even. So I tell that story to prove a point, to prove a point that the recipe I'm gonna share with you guys today is not something that came out of a book or something that I just made up. It's just the documentation of my experience over the last eight years since I started to trust myself. It may or may not work for you. No guarantees are given. But I believe with this methodology and a little trust and belief that your goals can be accomplished. And not just your goals can be accomplished, but your goals can be so much more than you ever dreamed. So let's jump into this a little bit. There's two components that I'm gonna share with you guys today. Two main methodologies that I utilize in the business today. One is a vision, the other is a strategic plan. So a vision, we're landscapers. Think conceptual landscape drawings, right? Before you go and do the blueprints, you're gonna give them a pretty picture of maybe what it's gonna look like. Now, you could probably build a park off this drawing, but I mean, what kind of fencing is that? What kind of steel is that? We need to create a submittal package. What type of concrete? Is it stamped? Is it permeable, right? I mean, there's a lot of questions that I have as a contractor when I look at this picture. But it all starts with a vision. So you have to have a vision. You have to have something that is brief, easily explainable, and things that people can buy into before you connect, take the next step to create a blueprint. Plus, creating a blueprint is more expensive, 
it's a lot of time, energy, and expense. So a vision is like a conceptual drawing of a landscape. Strategic plan, you guessed it. It's the blueprints, specifications, detailed construction documents, a set that you can take to the county or city and get permitted. This is the strategic plan that when the private equity guys come knocking, you give them this. And all of a sudden that 5X multiple goes to seven or eight or nine X because you have a bulletproof strategic plan. So let's talk a little bit about what goes into a vision. First component is BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. I shared with you guys my BHAG. We're on our way, it's still our BHAG. Now, I have recently experimented with new BHAGs. I'm not gonna share any with you because as soon as I share them, they become reality and I'm really freaking scared at my current BHAG. I'm playing around in my head. So we're gonna see, but right now our BHAG is 30 million by 2030. The problem is, it's now becoming a three hag. What's a three hag? Three year, highly achievable goal. Dream small, start small. Start with a three year goal that's gonna be highly achievable that even if you really make some mistakes, you're probably still gonna hit the goal, right? A three hag gets you on the way to the B hag, but you gotta build momentum before you take that rocket ship to the moon. The next thing is you need core values. How are we gonna behave? How are we gonna act? How are we gonna treat our customers, our clients, our employees, each other, maybe even our families? Maybe we take these core values home. So core value is gonna give you the guidance of how your culture, the fundamentals of how you behave at your company on your way to your big goal. And purpose. Any Simon Sinek fans in the room? Yeah. Simon's big on purpose. Simon's big on impact. So you can decide, your BHAG does not have to be financially motivated. Your BHAG could be to impact a certain amount of people through this process. It could be volunteer hours. It can be giving back to the community. Your BHAG does not have to be financially related. It doesn't even have to be metrically related. It can just be something really huge, really cool that you're excited to do with your life. But purpose is really important. At KD, our purpose is to raise the bar in the landscape industry. It's to promote professionalism in the landscape industry. It is what NALP and this conference is all about. It's taking the professional le level from here and bringing it here. And that's why I'm on stage today. That's why I am sharing my insights and experience because our purpose is to raise the bar in the landscape industry. That's what we're all about. So that's more or less what goes into a vision and then the final component is alignment. Because a vision without team alignment, well, it's just your own personal goals, which is good, but for a company, you need alignment. So this is one of those slides. Like I said, some of you were in, some of you were not in the room. This PowerPoint is a strategic document. This PowerPoint is gonna be sent to all of you at the end of the show, and you guys can feel free to use this. I'm not gonna read the PowerPoint. That's not the type of speaker I am. I, feel that is disengaging and boring and we just had lunch, I don't wanna put you all to sleep. But you guys can just see this right here, BHAG, 3HAG, core values, purpose, and alignment. That's what makes a vision, all right? And then we're gonna go into strategic plan. Before I go into strategic plan, I kinda told you guys at the very beginning, I just conducted an experiment, right? I just conducted an experiment on my own personal life to test and see if this methodology that I've been working on for the last eight years is actually useful. So this is what I did. My wife and I have our bucket lists. She started hers and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm gonna create mine too. And so now we have a bucket list and we have it on, on our bathroom walls so we see it every single day. There's about five, maybe 10 things on, on our individual bucket list. And then we have, a, have a, a joint bucket list. One of those is we wanna go to Italy. And I'm happy to report we are headed to Italy on Wednesday evening for about three weeks. I'm really excited for that. We're checking that off. That's not the experiment though. The experiment was, okay, if this goal setting thing and this vision thing, this is me talking to myself, really works, Justin, then you should apply it to something on your bucket list and see if you can actually get something done. See if you can have some proof that you can share with the folks when you go to talk and share your experience of a strategic plan and a vision. So I said, well, let's do it, all right. Looked at my bucket list and said, what is the most unreasonable, unattainable thing on this list that I can get done in 12 months? Maybe something that is almost impossible to get done in 12 months. So uh, boom, picked it. I've always wanted to become a pilot and buy my own airplane. 
My great-grandfather was a pilot. He flew B-52s and all that fun stuff, and I've always seen pictures and thought, since I was a little kid, I really wanted to be a pilot. I used to visit my mom in Oklahoma City. We've got an Oklahoma Inn over here. And I would watch, and this is like, I'm two, three years old. I don't remember. This is just my mom and grandma telling me this. I would just stare at the planes taking off at the airport. So I've had this fascination with planes, and it's been on my bucket list. And I thought, one day I'm going to sell the business for $100 million. I'm going to retire. I'm going to go become a pilot, buy a plane. So what if I tested this methodology and see if I could get this done in 12 months? So August 29th, 2022, I walk into a flight school in Watsonville, California, and I say, hey, what's it uh, take to become a pilot? And they're like, do you want to go fly right now? I was like, fuck. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> And he's like, all right, cool. Like, Kelly just had a cancellation. He's one of our instructors. Uh, let's go. You're, you're, you're like five minutes. Let's go. So all of a sudden, I'm just like, palms are sweaty. I've never been in a small airplane. I'm getting nervous. And here comes Kelly. Kelly Sunstreet. And I see Kelly. I'm like, Kelly, what the hell? He was a good high school buddy of mine. We haven't talked in probably 10 years. And immediately, I knew there was something special going on. And I, I'm like getting chills talking about it. I'm like, fuck. Okay, so we get in the plane, we start it up, we take off, and immediately he's like, your controls. And I flew that airplane for an hour and a half without him touching anything. And the adrenaline, the excitement, I immediately was hooked. And when I go in on something, I go all in. Ask my wife, it's the most annoying thing she ever has to deal with. When I get into golfing, I'm like, I'm golfing like five days a week, it's a problem. So of course, now I'm flying three, four, five days a week, it's a problem. Luckily, I was at a point in my career where I made up, you know, we, we, I didn't make anything up. We had a strategic plan. And I looked at the strategic plan and it's like, oh, 2026, acquisitions, expansion geographically. We want to expand from Central California to Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, and Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Well, you're going to need a plane for that, right? So now it's a business expense. <laughs> I shit you not, my controller was not happy about this because it was not in our 22 budget. But guess what? It was in our 23 budget. Sure. So here we are. <laughs> it's a true story. So here we are, March 15th, 2023, and I got my check ride. If I pass this check ride, it's a four hour process with, a, with an examiner. If I pass this thing, I get my freaking private pilot. And four hours later, I was shaking his hand. Justin White, you're officially a private pilot. Boom. Big check. All right, bucket list. Part A is complete. Part B is I got to go buy an airplane now, right? To make this experiment worth it. And as I thought about this talk, I was like, I really want to share this experiment, but the experiment was not complete. And I've been working on buying an airplane for the last four months. And about a month ago, I finally found an airplane. A good friend of mine, who's also a pilot, decided to partner with me. And we went in on, on an offer. And we're working, we're negotiating just like you would buy in another asset, but you gotta deal with the FAA and all this other stuff. And I'm proud to stand before you as a private pilot and a proud owner of an airplane as of six, five days ago. September 5th, 2023, I officially accomplished my bucket list item. <laughs> Wild. And I'm like, I'm still shaking, like this really jacks me up. And I share that story with you guys today because I want to hopefully inspire at least one person in this room to go to their bucket list tonight or tomorrow. And if you don't have a bucket list, perfect, create one. Pick the most unreasonable, unattainable, uncomfortable goal on there and set your mind to accomplishing that. Now, you don't have to do it in 371 days like I did, but maybe try. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll do something. Maybe you'll get halfway there. So that's the power of setting goals. Now, Liz talked about dreaming small. I started dreaming small in 2015, but as of today, I can dream really, really fucking big. And now, I'm really scared to set my next goal because I just accomplished this giant thing on my bucket list, and I'm like, do I climb Mount Everest? Do I, like, what do I do next? I'm really excited to set that next goal. I don't know what it's going to be, but I know it's going to be exciting. I know it's going to bring me in. And while I'm on this journey, as my team is trying to schedule meetings with me, and my executive assistant's like, oh, that's not gonna work. Well, where the hell is, what is, why is Justin so busy? Oh, he's got flight training from two to five that day. 
Well, now I got my team involved in this. And my employees are excited about this journey. And I take them up on flights. And we go have lunch now. An hour, what an what a hour drive is, is a 15 minute flight. And we go have a hamburger for lunch. Talk about a one to one that takes one to ones to the next level, right? Take them up to 7,000 feet and really get to know the person you're sitting next to. All right, so let's talk about strategic plans. What goes into a strategic plan? This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where you, you're not gonna get this done in a day. The vision thing, you can probably do in a day. This is much more than one day, all right? A vision is the first part of your strategic plan. We already did that. It's the BHAG, 3HAG, core values, boom. You got your vision done, dink. All right, you're 10% on your way. Congratulations. Second step, a detailed five-year plan. You need year-over-year -year financial data. You need year-over-year -year financial projections. You need employee count. You need goals. You really need to get into the nuts and bolts of your five-year plan. You need to really set this up. What goes into your five-year plan? Honestly, type it into chat GPT. It's gonna give you a bunch of great options. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what goes into your five-year plan because if you're looking at acquisitions or pot potentially you're looking to sell or potentially you're looking what I call grow to flow, grow your company to cash flow it, you're gonna have a slightly different metrics, right? You're going to sell EBITDA, 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 EBITDA. And, and culture and all that good stuff. But EBITDA is huge, right? You want to get the biggest multiple. If you're looking to grow to flow, you want culture super, super important, which culture is always important. I don't want to discount that. But you also are going to look at maybe investing a little more in the front end for the next five years so you can really cash flow year six through 10, right? So it really depends on what your goals are, depending on what your five-year specific plan is going to be. I alluded to a financial plan, but really do a deep dive. There's some amazing groups out there we use a Herring Group, and they help us with this financial planning process. It's really, really impactful when you can set a big goal, a financial goal, and then achieve that. It builds a lot of momentum with your team. Cash is king, right? Cash is always king. Something that we always, I think, discount in the landscape industry, most owners are operationally centric. They're focused on ops because that's where we grew up. I was lucky enough to have a have a brother who's really good at ops, so I leaned a little more towards the sales and marketing side. And I believe it's easy to get to the top of the hill to be the bully in your market when it comes to sales and marketing. And if your pipeline is full and you've got leads flooding in, freaking double down. Double down on that. Get more leads coming in because if you're taking market share and you're the big company in your market or you're becoming the big company in your market, there's no reason not to double down. And if you're a small company looking for market share, if you're a small company looking for market share, you should be spending three to 5% on marketing of your annual revenue. Three to 5% on annual revenue. 50,000 if you're a $1 million company, 500,000 if you're a $1 million company. I promise it will work. All right, come on, what do we got here? All right, org chart. Chase Mullen and the folks next door talked about this this morning. Super important to know what your company looks like today, have a good org chart, and then what it's gonna look like in the future. And I'm gonna speed through this a little bit. Like I said, you guys are gonna get this. I just don't wanna miss anything. We all talk about hiring, training, developing our team, but how many talk about an exit strategy? We didn't have an exit strategy for a long time. And I don't mean like selling your business and getting out. I mean. How do you exit employees from your company? I am from the great country of California. <laughs> it's been nice visiting the United States out here in Texas recently. Um, things are not easy in California when it comes to exiting employees. We have a very clear exit strategy. Be happy to share that with you guys, but it involves a severance agreement every time and it involves a nice paycheck for our employee. Whether they did something wrong and we have five or seven write-ups and they still don't show up on time, we still give them a nice check and offer a severance agreement. That protects us from liability and lawsuit. That also protects us from negativity in the market. So when our employees, as they usually do after they exit, go work for our competitor or another competitor or another landscape company, how is it over at KD? Oh, they're pretty fucking hard ass over there, you know? But honestly, they, they gave me a nice check nice chunk of change to walk away and gave me a soft landing to get me to my next opportunity. That is a perfect 
past employee. And all of us have turnover. There's just no way to get around it. So if you're turning over 30, 40, 50, 70, I've heard 70% turnover in some of our businesses, how would you not have an exit plan for your team that is eventually gonna leave? Because this is becoming very, very important with Gen Zs. Gen Zs don't wanna, you know, have, has anyone heard about the sharing of financial, should I say, salary data, right? They're posting it on TikTok and Instagram. I say they, like I'm old. <laughs> what? Pay transparency. Yeah, pay transparency, thank you. It's a, I think it's a great thing, honestly. We've been posting our pay ranges on our job ads for a very long time. California now requires it, no biggie. But having a good chart of compensation, everyone wants to talk about salary and day-to-day -day income. What's my weekly check gonna be? Well, okay, that's a part of it. But if you don't talk about the other six, seven, eight components of compensation, you're leaving a lot on the table that you're giving that you're not leveraging, whether it's in your hiring, your interviewing, or your retention process. So make sure you have a plan for comp and benefits beyond just the salary. Okay. Legendary customer service. What does that mean? Legendary customer service means when a client works with you, they talk about it. Because people talk about legends. And if you're able to deliver legendary customer service to your community, the people you serve, referrals start pouring in. I don't know about you guys, but referrals provide a much higher profitability percentage than just some Google paid ad that I got a client on. Referrals are primed, they're warm, they're ready to jump in, and they heard about your legendary customer service. It's I shouldn't say it's easy to deliver legendary customer service when you're small, but it's easier when you have two or three crews that you're in charge of and that's your entire company. That's where I was at one day. And I could go to every job twice a day and make sure that things were perfect. I annoyed the hell out of my foreman. But as you scale, you have to now put this into your strategic plan. Remember, this talk is not about how to run your business. This is creating a strategic plan. You guys are probably doing all this stuff already. So this is nothing brand new, revolutionary. You're in this room because you're leaders, you're professionals in your industry. I'm just asking, why don't you document it before you grow to 30 million or 50 million or a billion dollars? Like I know all of you guys are going. So document what you're doing so as you scale, the team can implement that. And if you're getting ready to start up a new branch, what a great way to have a playbook that they can operate. We've all heard of SWATs. I think they're a decent thing to do. We do them twice a year. I think they're a little played out, but why not, right? It takes a little bit, gets your team engaged. If you're doing a SWAT with just your leadership team or just the owners, you're missing out on a whole group of people who have ideas in your business. So if you are gonna do a SWAT, do multiple SWATs all the way down the organization. If you need to translate it into Spanish and have a Spanish speaking SWAT, and an English speaking SWAT, do it. Get every one of your employees to give you at least one strength, weakness, opportunity, threat. You're probably gonna have 50 or 60 in each category. Then you have to go through and pick them. That's where the leadership team comes in. Then you pick them. That's a true actual SWAT that came out of your company. If the leadership team does it, you're just looking at it from the 30,000 foot view, you're seeing the 2D blueprint. Maybe you're just seeing the 2D conceptual plan. You're not even seeing the blueprints. So a SWAT should incorporate ideas from your entire company, top to bottom. Like I said before, scale or sell, scale to sell, or grow to flow. What's your idea? Everyone should have an exit plan. I don't care how old you are, I don't care how small or big your company is, you should always have an exit strategy, whatever that is. Whether you wanna retain equity and, and just cash in, cash in, cash in, or you want a big paycheck. Whatever your goal is, put it down. Now here's where I think a lot of people go wrong. They say, well Justin, Man, I love everything until this slide. I cannot put this in my strategic plan and share it with my company. How am I gonna tell everyone I'm gonna be a rich man in five years when we sell this company and everyone else is just gonna continue to have a job? It's a good fucking point, okay. So what we do is we bring our employees into the conversation. We're not an ESOP. I'm not sharing equity with anyone. It's not currently an owner right now. But they can still get a piece of the pie when we sell. They can still get a piece of the pie when we flow. 
So think about profit sharing programs on the short term if you're a flow. Think about acquisition or, or transition when you sell. How can you get all your employees a little piece of that pie? And start to think about that. And if you're like, this is completely out of my realm, well, you have a huge room, not only here but out there, 2,000 people in the network. I guarantee there's a lot of people here that have successfully sold their businesses or a chunk of it, and a lot of their employees got a payday that day. A lot of their employees were able to go pay their cars off or pay down their mortgage because of that transition in equity, because a private equity guy came in, nice big paycheck, and that owner was gracious and humble enough and smart enough, I think, to share it with his employees or her employees. So if you are gonna create the exit strategy, the scale to sell or grow to flow, make sure to include your employees in this. This is not an owner-centric slide, although on the face it can look that way. Uh, this is one of those strategic document slides. I am not gonna read this, there's way too many words. I like like five, maybe 20 words max on a slide, so there you go. All right guys, what's next, what do we got? <sighs> Quarterly planning, okay. So one of the systems that I put in place and how I believe we are able to achieve what most companies takes a year, we're able to achieve in 90 days. I'll repeat that. In 90 days, we can accomplish what the average landscape or trade company accomplishes in a year. How? Quarterly planning sessions. Our brains work in 90 day rotations. I guarantee if I asked you about something you did around July 4th, you'll probably remember it pretty good. But I started talking about May 30th and it seems like last year. Does anyone relate to that? Like there's an easier time to remember 90 days ago than six months ago. So if you are not quarterly planning and going back and reviewing your strategic goals, reviewing where you are at on your year plan, your five year, 10, 15 year plans, every 90 days, you are missing out on massive traction, on massive growth, you're leaving on the table because you don't wanna spend two days in a conference room with your team talking about how to be better. It's not easy. Our quarterly planning session is coming up October 5th, 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. It's that week, we do one with every department, and then we do a two-day off-site leadership. And then we bring everyone back together the following Friday for what we call the all-hands meeting. And I give a speech kind of like I'm giving to you guys today, except there's a lot more, I don't know, activities going on. We got food and all that fun stuff. It's all about inspiring the team, staying on track. And actually, this picture is... <laughs> this was the, the birth of our water management department. And for those who follow me and who caught me in Vegas with Lauren, I, I shared our story about how we launched our water management department. Uh, it brought us 2 million at 62% in the first year. Great bolt on for us in California. This is our team. Something's better than nothing, guys. Something is better than nothing. Look, I just threw so much information at you. And if you're like me, you're probably thinking, how the hell am I gonna implement any of that? Well, something is better than nothing. So if you can just do a little bit, if all you come away with today is a BHAG, and maybe that isn't where you're at yet, you just wanna start small, dream small, maybe it's the three HAG, something's better than nothing. So don't feel like you have to come up with the next revolutionary idea, just take one bite of the apple at a time and create something. Something's better than nothing. So I want to open the room up. I have more to say. I can obviously can talk for a long time, as you guys can see. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> I had some help with this. My, uh, my executive assistant, Katrina, is amazing. She helped put my ideas into, this, into these slides. But I want to open up the room for questions. It's a small room. I think we can all hear each other. If you want to step up the mic, you can. Does anyone have questions? I've got a question right here. Yes, sir. Yeah, what role do you actually, or not, actually um, adopt? <laughs> in relation to EOS. A lot of us have been yeah. EOS and vision and traction. Yeah. And we, we struggle sometimes with drinking the Kool-Aid 100%. Yeah. It sounds like you've kind of made your own version of it. Would you agree or, or would you speak to that? Someone was paying attention. <laughs> so EOS, yes, what's up with EOS? Do you practice EOS? If so, how much or how much or a little? So we started off with Rockefeller Habits and the Scale Up Methodology. I went to a few of Vern's conferences. Great, great guy, still read his books and his weekly newsletters. We then moved to EOS. It was a simple, more simple format and it gave us what we need. That was in 2018, we moved to EOS 
and it was revolutionary. We did have an implementer. If anyone has EOS or is thinking about EOS, highly recommend hiring an implementer. By the way, EOS is not in the room, so I can say this. They have a very tight lock on who's a certified implementer. There are a lot of coaches out there, mine included, Jonathan Goldhill, who know a lot about EOS and who aren't technically in their little certified cool kids club. So there's, there's still people out there that can help you implement EOS, even if they're not a technical implementor. What we do with EOS is we use, I would say we use the L10, we use the VTO, we use some of those tools, but we continuously adapt them to our own needs. I've got a really great financial controller who is strategic minded. I call her my part-time CFO, part-time controller. And she's always creating these new PowerPoint slides that she updates weekly and monthly that provide us basically the same information you get out of the EOS traction software, 90IO software, or their proprietary EOS software. Uh, we do run on a software that's similar to uh, traction tools is what it's called. And it gives us our L10 format and some other things. So EOS is a great program, highly recommend it. If you're like, what the heck is EOS? Awesome, there's a book called What the Heck is EOS? You can get it on Audible or Amazon or any of those. Really recommend it, yes sir? So when you took over the business from your family, how long did you wait to change processes, people, yeah. and you know. Yeah, it's a great question. I would say 24 hours. But I'll put a little disclaimer. We changed only processes at the beginning. I changed, and my, my I, I can't say I, it's we, because I really involved the team. My mom and dad were still mentors. It wasn't like a hostile takeover, right? So I, I was still had a great team, but what I did was I asked myself, what are changes I can put in place that employees are gonna enjoy? What are things we can do differently that the employees are gonna like? Like giving everyone a raise. I did that day one. And I started looking at, I was like, dude, how are you living here? So I started, I, so the next change, I raised our prices like 40, 50% over the course of three months. I lost so many clients. But I didn't care because I knew we were undercharging. And as we started to raise our prices, all of a sudden, that line of credit was maxed out, started getting paid off, credit cards started getting paid off, I was giving out raises, and we were making money. And guess what, we were providing such a better service, legendary I would say, our employees were so, because our employees were happy, we had more customers, we had referrals, and we started to get a higher end customer. All of a sudden, we were getting $1 million customers, now we're getting $10 million company customers. And when I say that, I mean like quality customers that you always thought were out of your league, all of a sudden knocked on our door asking if we could bid on their maintenance property. And I was like, dude, that's like, I've got to hire like five people. That's like 30% of my company. But I said, yes, of course, like, like any 25 year old would do. And, and we figured it out. So I would say, and then the last thing I really changed was the fundamental systems and processes of the business. And unfortunately, it's just part of growth. There are, there's two employees who are like close, close friends and what I would consider like uncles to me that no longer work for the company. Uh, we had to separate at some point, both of them in the last two years. And after, you know, one was with us for 25 years, one was with us for 19 years. And unfortunately, at a certain point, you have to ask yourself, do these like legacy employees really believe in the vision where you're taking the company? And unfortunately, they did not. And, and we had to make, I had to make that ultimately hard decision. And there's a lot of people we've had to exit from the business, but we have an exit strategy. And we gave them a lot of money and they're happy and we're happy and everything's better today. Yeah. Long-winded answer, but hopefully it answered your oh, question. That's exactly what we needed. Thank okay, you. awesome. All right, who else? Any other questions about there? What kind of plane did you buy? <laughs> I, I bought a 1978 Grumman Tiger. Badass little four-seater, low wing, cruising. I did not fly it to Dallas, because that'd be an eight and a half hour flight from California, but I will be flying it probably to anything in Las Vegas or Arizona. Yeah, what else? Yes, ma'am. How did your parents handle like the rapid growth and I'm like, yeah, like similar situation. Okay. Get some backhanded compliments <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. When they see success yeah. here and they weren't able to make that happen for themselves. It's a great question. And it really is a challenge. I, I use the word, I use the word candor and extreme candor when it comes to communication with family. Uh, my mom's, my, my mom is my biggest fan, always has been, but at that moment she was not. At that moment, I think she saw her company going into a bad direction in her viewpoint, and she did not believe in me very publicly. And that was hard. 
And we've worked through that as, as, a, as a relationship with my mom. And she texted me an hour ago, wishing me the best of luck, right? I think they're both very proud of me today. But I will be honest, there were times and days and meetings and family meetings that were very tense. Tears, emotional, but we were always honest and we always put it on the table, at least as much as we could. So I would just say, sometimes you have to push through the adversity, push through the negativity, and trust, I said earlier, trust in yourself. And if you trust in yourself and you believe in yourself, the chances are you are gonna be rapidly, ultimately successful, and then everyone's gonna be super proud of you. And then everything's good. <laughs> believe me, I was a black sheep in my family for a very long time, and now, it's all good, right? Because I'm successful, quote unquote. But yeah, when I dropped out of high school, it was not a popular decision with my family. <laughs> yes, sir. So Tristan. I, like, obviously, having staying stagnant <laughs> at that one, one million, one and a half million, first yeah. of all, getting the buy in from the people that are already there, or bring in, bring in new people with yeah. the mindset. Yeah, that's a great question. That's where our company was at for a lot, like 30 years probably, I think, 18, 1986 to 2015. Ultimately, if you've been trying to grow the business for more than three years and you've been implementing some of this stuff, you probably don't have the right people. That's what it is. It's the people make the difference. So right person, right seat. You could have the right people in the wrong seat, find a better seat. But ultimately, I would say your problem, there is one or two people that you know their names right now as I say this, that you need to exit from the business that is holding you back. And as soon as you do that and you bring in the right people with the mindset, you'll be five million in no time, dude. Yeah, seriously. It's all about the people. And coach, I would just suggest yeah. a, a mentor or a coach. Yep. Um, advisor consulting, Jay Scott. Yeah, there's a lot of industry professionals that helped me, I was stagnant at five million for three years. Yeah. And I just was, it, it was so hard, but getting that outside consulting yeah. could come in and really just give it to you. And then you also have somebody to say, so like if it is a family member, or if it is someone who's a long-term person that yep. you know, maybe helped you start the business, well then now you have the consultant to say, kind of as a cushion between you and yeah. the person. Yeah, you don't have to be the bad guy. You don't have to be the bad guy. You can say, hey, look, you know, I brought these guys in to help the business. Unfortunately, you know, we're going to make some changes. Uh, and it, it helped me like the load on some people. Dude, I love that experience share. And that's what, you know, Jay Scott, Marty Grunder, all these, all these peer groups are all about, experience share. And that's a great experience share. I call it the, you've got your peer group. I highly recommend joining a peer group, a professional coach, and then seek out mentors. Right, you're here, there's a lot of mentors. There's people here that I guarantee you ask to lunch or you ask for a Zoom call next week or next month, we'll say yes. I'm one of them, I know we've been talking. But at the end of the day, you don't, like the best quarterbacks in the NFL, guess who's on the sidelines calling in the plays? The coach. I wrote an article that says, it's titled Put Me In Coach. It's on Lawn and Landscape Magazine. If you just go to their website and search Put Me In Coach, it'll come up. It's my experience with coaches and, and that is such a true statement. Uh, all right, check it out. It's 2 o'clock. The exhibit hall is open. So if you all want to leave, this, the session is officially over. But I'm happy to stop, stay here and, and talk and shoot the shit as long as you guys want to shoot the shit. So thanks, guys.